Hello, Megalithomaniacs. Today, we're speaking with Andrew Collins about some really interesting new research coming out of Karahan Tepe and the sites in the whole Tes Tepela region of southeast Turkey. And many of you know Andrew. He's a well-known author and explorer and researcher. He's published many books, including some about Gebekli Tepe and the sites in that region. And we've been visiting there with Andrew, myself and JJ, uh, since about 2014 was the first time I went there. Andrew's been going there for much longer than that. And um, and over the years, it's become this sort of unfolding story, especially now that Karahan Tepe has started to be excavated since 2019 by Neshmi Karul and his team. Um, so we're going to get into a few different things that we, we've been kind of uh, slowly discovering as more gets excavated. Um, I just want to start by mentioning something that both Andrew and I and JJ um, were involved with. We were there in May this year on, on our tour uh, with a group and JJ and I just spotted on the sides of the kind of western edge of structure AD, the main, the great ellipse, the, the main enclosure there. These on the sides of it, so these carvings of animals that none of us had seen before. And it was quite odd because we, we me and Andrew, JJ, we've been there many times over the last few years and just not seen them. It's almost, and I made a little video about this, one of the short videos on YouTube and TikTok and stuff. And, but I find that odd because something that I've been talking with you about, Andrew, for a while is this the fact that, like, um, as the sun moves round at certain times of year, you get this kind of, um, angle of the sun will actually kind of bring out more of these very subtle relief carvings and that seems to have been the case with these ones because we've been there we've photographed it we've been there multiple different times a year but never in may i don't think since it's been excavated and suddenly these things emerge on the sides of these giant rock cut hypogeum style kind of pillars with benches between them carved out of the bedrock on the western side of this enclosure so that was really i found that really interesting that they hadn't been spotted before haven't been recorded haven't been mentioned by any of the archaeologists even ishmael led i don't think was aware of them i was actually pointing them out to one of the, the security guys there because we, we kept trying to get photos of this same thing over and over again so just that alone is interesting but there's more i mean there's more discoveries that we're going to be discussing and uh yeah so i just want to welcome andrew in here um i just wanted to get, get your opinion on you know the fact that we're still finding things like this at Karahan tepe well i mean quite clearly there's so much to be found there and as you said i mean a lot of it is to do with the lighting you know, at different times of the year, um, depending on what time of day that you're there, um, you know, you're going to be seeing more and more. Now, whether the archaeologists, you know, were aware of this or not, I don't know. Um, but what's so interesting is obviously you mentioned it whilst I was on the top of the hill. So I went down to try and look for them. But I was looking at the wrong side. I was looking at the, the southern side of them. And I thought I could see, um, you know, um, uh, carvings on those as well which I thought is the ones you were talking about uh, um, and I think that they are real the only problem is is that the ones on as you're looking south towards you know the buttresses um, are so faint that it's really difficult to make out what's there it's only on the other sides as you're looking north the ones that you were pointing out that you can actually really see the animals and what's interesting that one of those animals is actually facing towards the bedrock itself. It's like upright and facing towards the bedrock, um, which is an interesting stance. But it also means that if somebody's sitting there on that um, bench, then and they're looking outwards, the animal is looking at them directly. It's almost like the animals, you know, attacking them in some way, which I find, you know, a, an interesting uh, stance, really. One of the other th one of the other things you noticed as well, we, we were kind of because we got we, because of the light was so good at that particular day we were there in May. Um, we noticed on the front of the kind of buttresses, the upright bedrock kind of pillars that these kind of leopard kind of headless leopards really on the base of them. And we've spotted another one there. There's quite a well-known one there that's been documented before. My, my friend Dakota, Dakota Wynn, he, he kind of spotted that and filmed that, photographed that. And it's been, you know, on Graham Hancock's Ancient Apocalypse as well. And he felt it was like a sort of hooded figure without the head was kind of missing. But then we found one on the another pillar that we just happened to see because of the angle of the light during the May time we were there. 
and you had this realization that perhaps they're they're actually like almost like leopard pelts which is incredible you know if you think about how the size of what leopards can be so what, what do you make of that uh well i think that there is you know no doubt in my mind at all that these are leopard um leopard skin pelts being used as loincloths um and you've only got to go back to gebekli tepe to realize that animal skins were being used in this way because um, on certainly on pillar 18 in enclosure D, you've got the, the fox pelt uh, loincloth there. I think I think there's one on the one next to it on pillar 31, which is the other central pillar in um, enclosure D. But it's clear that, you know, these animal skins are being used in that way. And as you say, you've got them on two of the buttresses, which show that those buttresses really are supposed to be anthropomorphic. Um, and thus, you know, uh, rock cut T pillars. But also, as you say, there's another one which is on the side of a T pillar that's used, being used as a bench on the north side of the Great Ellipse, uh, you know, which is structure AD at Corahan. I mean, it's clearly there. And that also means that that T pillar is in secondary use. I mean, where it was before that time, we don't know. But this is beginning to tell me that in addition to what we're going to come on to, which is the snake uh, imagery there, which is incredibly important, is that there was some kind of cult associated with the leopard at Karahan. And what I've already suggested in, in other books uh, is that this leopard cult, which of course goes on to be found at places like Chatel Hoyak in the ceramic Neolithic, I think he's possibly a female cult. Um, and the reason I say that is because obviously in much later times in the, the Bronze Age and also within mythical tradition, you've got the use of leopard pelts um, being uh, worn by the maniads, the, um, the, the, the frenzied followers in the cult of Dionysus or Bacchus, uh, who would tear... Um, people apart if they got in their way and these were females and so I think that there's a strong chance that the the leopard cult uh, at Corahan uh, and obviously uh, probably at Gebekli where you also find a lot of leopard um, carvings and imagery could be a female cult and I find that 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 interesting. That's, fasc that's fascinating to me and JJ because uh, we're both you know very focused on this idea of there being like a feminine aspect to it. I mean, you discovered that the name, the original name of um, uh, Karahan Tepe being Ketchley or Ke Ke Ketchley, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. The KEC, the root of that is a feminine root. And so even the name, the original name of the site, I mean, people should be aware of this, isn't Karahan Tepe, which funnily enough means something like Dark Lord or something like this, which, which is kind of funny. It's actually got a feminine aspect. And myself and JJ have been looking into much of the symbolism there. And we keep finding, especially JJ, all this stuff, uh, like the cut marks and different symbology, which seems to push the idea that there is a very feminine aspect there. So it kind of backs up what we've been looking at as well so i find that fascinating but can you tell us can you just mention a bit about the the name of the name of the site in more in a bit more detail yeah i mean this really came about because the the name of the farm itself is ketchley um and we realized that the original name of Corahan um was just ketchley i mean whether it's even ketchley tepe we're not sure but just ketchley which um was known about by the, um, the 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 owners of the farm certainly for a uh, hundred years or so, um, and they knew that it was actually a Kurdish um, name and not a Turkish name. In Turkish, Ketch, the root of Ketchali basically means goat, which makes sense because obviously it's a farm and there's goats there. However, in Kurdish, Ketch, the most obvious. Um, you know, um, translation of the word catch means bald, as in a bald head like I've got here. And um, that makes sense. And that's obviously the way that the family interpreted it. But if you ask around and talk to Kurdish people, they say that the word catch um, is a female derived term, which can mean anything from woman to daughter to queen um, you know, in other words, a personage who is female, basically. 
And the fact that we're talking about heels that could well have been seen as representations of female anatomy, uh, I find that really, really interesting. And it seems to suggest that the root of Karahan itself is of a female, a divine female, and that the hill itself was almost seen as a personification of that female form. Oh, uh, that's another funny thing just to go with that. My mum, uh, when she got remarried, um, her surname became Ketch, which uh, I thought <laughs> I think is quite quite a bizarre little coincidence. Um, uh, but anyway, and she's, she's kind of kept that name for the, anyway for now. So yeah, fascinating. So we're going to look at a couple of other things uh, you've been looking at. Uh, we're going to show some uh, imagery here. We're going to open up um, some slides so you can describe what's being found. But fundamentally, you find uh, we've been discussing this and it seems like something quite important that is strangely obvious, but you don't really see it until it's pointed out. So let's get this open. Let's point this out to people because this is a fascinating area um, of research. OK, let, let's get on to uh, what we found, basically. And it, it concerns the, the pillar shrine, um, which we'll talk about. But the main symbolism at Karahan, uh, and this has long been noted, is quite clearly the snake, okay? Um, right from the early days uh, in the mid-1990s when Bahatin Chelak, who was then with the uh, University of Haran, was uh, exploring the sky, uh, surveying it, um, you know, he discovered serpent imagery. Uh, and the first ever T-shaped pillar uh, that was, um, you know, that was recorded was this one that's on the screen now, which you can see this quite weird looking snake on the side of it with a ball shaped head which you know some people when they looked at it they said oh you know looks like a, a, a sperm or something like this so i mean that was our first indication really that snakes were important there and, and i did write about this in uh, an, an article that i did on Karahan, which is available online but then of course obviously with the excavations uh, starting in 2019 uh, they have uncovered a lot of other snake imagery there, um, most obviously connected with structure AB, which we like to call the, the, the pillar shrine. Uh, I mean, for instance, you've got these uh, 11 uh, pillars actually rising up out of the, the, the base of the structure, uh, 10 of which are actually cut out of the bedrock itself. But the 11th one, which is, is highlighted here, uh, was clearly made elsewhere and has been slotted into place. And it does seem to have features suggesting that of, of a creature, a reptile, and I would say possibly even a striking snake. I mean, you can actually see uh, this horizontal line roughly where the mouth is, which I think is deliberately carved. And to me, this probably represents some kind of uh, genius loci of the site, some kind of uh, spirit presence in the form of a snake, very similar to the Nagas um, in uh, Vedic tradition, uh, well, and in Buddhic tradition as well, which are guardians of sacred places and also of buried treasure. And I think that that's what we've got there. But the most obvious, um, you know, feature, of course, is the head that emerges out of the side of the shrine. And, you know, this is on a long serpent-like neck which is recognized by Nesmi Carroll it's talked about by Graham Hancock uh, and it has horizontal lines across it or parallel lines which clearly represent the underside of the neck of a snake but the head itself which is about twice the size of a human head maybe even larger than that um, is clearly human but it seems to me like it's some kind of snake genius. I mean, there's a representation here that you can see from an 18th century Ottoman manuscript. Um, and it was taken from a, a much earlier, I think, Persian uh, text uh, from the 13th century, which shows what you might describe as a, a snake genius. Um, so what is the, the function of this? What What is actually going on here? Well, other uh, snake imagery, which can be mentioned immediately, is that next to the pillar shrine, you have this other shrine, which is structure AA, which I call the pit shrine, 
we have this incredibly long snake along the bench um, where people would sit again cut out of the bedrock and I mean this is this is huge this snake I mean it goes on for several feet I mean it could even be eight nine feet in length um, and it seems to be incised as opposed to carved like the normal reliefs but what's interesting is that these two structures which you can see here seem to be joined and when I say joined I mean as far as the path that you take to get from one to the other by this long curved groove and uh, Nesmi Carroll himself talks about this in terms of a uh, serpentine uh, form in nature. Now, it's been suggested by the archaeologists that it's used to run water, you know, possibly to pour libations, offerings, so that it would flow from, from one place to the other. Now, that may be the case, although having studied it at close quarters, I would say right in the centre, it actually goes up slightly, which, you know, would be uh, bad masonry if... Uh, that was the case, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, it, it, it does rise in the centre. But anyway, it could easily be been used for that. That's not my concern. But what's interesting was that we were talking about this um, at the Megalithomania tour of Turkey in May amongst the group. I mean, basically what happened was that, you know, Hugh, myself, JJ had been giving various lectures and we went to uh, Gobekli and Karahan on one of the days, and we just threw it open to the audience themselves, and we just said to everybody, you know, what's your views on these sites that we've seen? I mean, you know, you your eyes can have seen things that, that we have missed. I mean, and we haven't got all the answers, and we openly accept that. So what did you see? And one of the ladies, um, when I was showing this, uh, maybe a lady called Chell Hamilton, she, she actually said, when she was looking at it, she said, do you think that the pillar shrine um, and this carved groove could be uh, a sperm, a representation of a sperm, a, you know, a human sperm? And I thought about this for a moment and realised that this was impossible because how would the ancients have been aware of what the human sperm looked like? I mean, clearly they didn't have microscopes. Um, so I, I mentioned this, but as I was saying this, I thought, well, wait a minute. What if the pillar shrine actually is a head, but not the head of a sperm, but the head of a snake? And the more I thought about this, the, the, the more I thought, actually, this may well be, you know, real. So I thought about it and one thing that we know about this region of Turkey, which is the, the re very remote Tek Tek Mountains, is that a common snake found there is the Anatolian meadow viper. Um, I mean, this is a very, very poisonous snake from I hear. Uh, and it is definitely found. And, and I mean, when Hugh and I were investigating the northern hill um, on the same farm, which faces out towards uh, Karahan Tepe, and which we today know as Kecheli Tepe, um, we were told to watch out for snakes up there, that they were poisonous. And although we didn't encounter any, you know, straight off, um, we, we, we were actually shown this pit with a whole load of stones in it. And, you know, there was um, snake skin in it, you know, just to prove the point that snakes re really are, you know, there or thereabouts. And, one of the species probably is the Anatolian meadow viper. Um, so, you know, this is the head of it here. And I just thought, well, what, I wonder what will happen if I put the head of this particular species of snake on the pillar shrine, assuming that the snake would have been there in the past. Well, you know, here's a, a nice overhead plan of the pillar shrine. And this is what happens if you put the head over it. It's almost a perfect fit. And I mean, I mean, when I saw this, I just thought this is extraordinary. And I mean, why has nobody ever noticed this before? That the actual pillar shrine itself may well be a the you know, the head, I mean a three-dimensional head of a snake. Um, and of course, at first I was thinking that the carved groove coming away from it 
was a sort of symbolic neck and body of that snake. You know, even Esme Carroll says that it's serpentine in nature. But as I was doing this, and I was doing it at the house of my good friend, uh, uh, Debbie um, Cartwright uh, and her husband, Ivan, and Graham Phillips was there as well. He was helping us out. And um, as they were doing this, I, I said, oh, my God, I said, wait a minute. What if the the neck isn't actually the groove itself? but it's actually the bedrock immediately above it. And the the groove is merely highlighting the presence of the neck. So and so I, I, I looked at it carefully and I thought, oh, my God, yes, that, that's it, it. In other words, the actual bedrock has been shaped to form the neck of it, and the groove is merely there to highlight its presence. And when I mentioned this to, you know, to to, to Debbie, uh, Ivan and Graham, I said, well, I thought that's what, we, that's what you were talking about anyway when you said the neck. They'd seen it and realised it before I'd even noticed it myself. So this is what I think the neck is. That's the neck. It's not the groove. It is actually the bedrock immediately above it. And what happens is that this neck curves around the... Um, um, the, the the other shrine next to it and eventually peters out towards the north uh, west. So, you know, that in itself, you know, could signal and the importance of that direction in connection with the snake. We'll come back to that. So, you know, but we're not just dealing with something looking down from above. The whole shrine itself is the head of the snake. It's three-dimensional. And if that's the case, what the hell would have been going on here in the past? So, and the question then becomes, why go into a snake's mouth? What would you be achieving by doing this? And the clue is, and I, I was having a conversation uh, about this with, with Debbie, um, you know, as, as all this was coming out. And she pointed out, she said, well, the, the clue is clearly sky burial. So I said, well, explain what you mean. She says, well, obviously, the whole concept of sky burials and this image here, by the way, uh, shows sky burials actually taking place on the Tibetan pla plateau in the modern day, is that vultures will come down and pick clean the human body, human cadaver. Um, and what... That means is that the birds are consuming the meat of the individual so that the individual, you know, let's say their soul or their spirit is actually becoming a part of the vulture itself. So that when the vultures fly off, they are actually taking the spirit or the soul of the individual with them. And this seems to be shown in a uh, mural that was discovered um, in the 1960s by James Mellart um, at Chateauhoyac, which, as we know, is, is a slightly later ceramic Neolithic structure, uh, dates from about 7,000 to about 5,500 BC. And here on this mural, you've got two towers, which I think are what they call excarnation, excarnation towers. Obviously, excarnation means moving out from carnation, you know, into, you know, another existence, uh, uh, another worldly environment. On the right, you've got the two vultures that seem to be devouring this, um, this, this matchstick person who doesn't have a head. And there's a very good reason for that, because if you look at the left tower, you can see only a head and two vultures that seem to be you know, um, putting this this head under its wing, taking it under its protection. And that head is a representation of the human soul because heads and skulls in the early Neolithic in Anatolia and the Near, Near East were represented by the human head or human skull. Um, and I think that that's what's being shown here is that the head represents the spirit or the soul being taken away. So... You know, this is also something we found on the pillar, the the the, the, the so-called vulture uh, stone pillar forty-three at Gebekli Tepe. You've got your vulture uh, there on the head of the stone. You've got this ball 
on the wing, which it almost seems to be protecting. Um, I think that that is a representation of a human skull um, or human head. In other words, the spirit of an individual uh, that's being, you know, literally guided into the sky world. And that sky world, as I've shown various of the books, I think is related to the Milky Way um, uh, with an entrance in the area of the Cygnus constellation, the celestial bird, which in this area has always been known as a vulture. And even to this day in neighbouring Armenia, Cygnus is still the celestial vulture called Anjek, or however it's pronounced. Um, so going back to this idea of entering the mouth of an otherworldly snake, the idea is to be consumed by the snake itself, to be eaten by it ritualistically once inside the pillar shrine. And in doing so, you then communicate with the active spirit. The snake is both psychopod, which is the Greek term for the, 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 the spirit of an animal that accompanies the, the soul into the next world or the other world. Um, but you're also communing with that snake. And I think that what's happening in the pillar shrine is that communication with the snake would take place. And that is symbolized by the giant stone head, which is on the end of the serpentine neck. And that, so in other words, the, the, the head itself is the active spirit of that snake, basically. But if that's the case, then where was this otherworldly snake? Well, obviously, as we know, um, you know, Hugh and JJ found this incredible alignment for midwinter um, at Corahan in connection with the Pillar Shrine. Uh, just after dawn on this day in the modern day, but also going back to 9000 BC, the, the, the winter solstice sun penetrates through the porthole window and illuminates the stone head. So we know that solstices are very, very important to do with this site. And one of the reasons why Hugh and JJ were, were looking specifically for, you know, solstice alignments at the time of, of midwinter was because I'd previously found that the neighbouring uh, pit shrine structure AA seemed to be aligned towards the summer solstice. I mean, the actual uh, orientation of it is approximately 302 degrees azimuth which is obviously um, the west northwesterly area. And if you look at the skies at the time of the summer solstice, which it exactly targets, you find that the sun is perfectly aligned. So in other words, if you were in the, the pit shrine in around 9000 BC, you would see directly in line uh, with that shrine, the sun setting. Now, that in itself is incredible because it, it makes it arguably one of the oldest um, solar alignments in the world. But that's just the beginning because not only is the sun, which you can see at the moment is in the sign of, of, of Scorpio, but just two to two and a half hours later, when it gets dark, the Milky Way is rising vertically up into the sky. And the position that it's rising vertically up from is in the area at the southern termination of what's known as the dark rift, which is this this line that breaks the the, the mid plane section of the Milky Way, which is caused by dust and debris. And where exactly this occurs in 9000 BC at Karahan, you have the stars of Ophiuchus, you have the stars of Sagittarius on the other side, and as I said, just below it setting with the sun you've got the stars of scorpius and the importance about all this area um it is the area here that you can see once again on the um the the the, the, the pillar sorry sorry the uh pillar 43 at gebekli tepe is that this is the area it's all the area around scorpius uh, and as we know that scorpius is actually represented on the vulture stone uh, by the scorpion that you can see and when you blow that up, you can see that next to it is this serpent and also just below that a fox. And all of these are clearly in the vicinity of the Scorpius constellation. 
And what we know is that this very shrine from which this alignment takes place is that you've got this long snake on the left and directly in front of it and facing the same direction, you have this fox. So the very two symbols associated with this area of the sky where the shrine seems to be pointing towards are both there, the fox and the snake. So, you know, we're obviously dealing with some kind of uh, celestial snake in that area of the sky. So what is it? Well, um, after much thought, um, my conclusions were that we're dealing with the Milky Way itself. The Milky Way is seen as a world encircling serpent in many different ancient cultures, from Scandinavia to Vedic traditions in India to Mesoamerica, Mesopotamia, uh, and North American tradition, all of which see the Milky Way as this huge celestial serpent of the sky. And if that's the case, then where is its head? Well, the head almost certainly is the galactic bulge. Um, and this is right by all of the constellations we just talked about there, Ophiuchus, Sagittarius and Scorpius um, at the southern termination of the Dark Rift. And this was seen anciently as a point of communication with the Milky Way. In other words, soul spirits that wish to enter onto the Milky Way would make a leap of faith towards this very point in the sky. So is it possible that this was the idea of what was happening in the pillar shrine communication with this cosmic entity in the form of a serpent, the head of the Milky Way serpent, bear in mind that they saw the head as symbolic of the, you know, the, the spirit of the soul of uh, an individual, you know, and of course that would be the same with the, um, with a snake as well, if it was in this cosmic form. Now, obviously in front of us, we see, actually see the Milky Way, um, we see the dark rift, which you can see on the left hand side here. You can see the stars of Scorpius um, and this whole area here, which is marked by galactic center, is where the head almost certainly would have been. Um, and this is interesting because if we come now back to Karahan, another alignment, which I think was incredibly important there, relates to the great ellipse itself, because we've already talked about midwinter. Uh, well, and midsummer and obviously midwinter, but just a few hours before the sun would have risen at Karahan, if you'd have been sitting on those thrones between the buttresses in the Great Ellipse, you would have seen horizontally rise right in front of you the Milky Way, in particular the area around the Galactic Bulge and the stars of Scorpius right in front of you, going between east and just south of east, which is precisely the orientation of the Great Ellipse. Um, and to me, I find this beyond coincidence, uh, particularly as we know that the exact same orientation, which is around 10 degrees south of east, is exactly what the um, that the great head inside the pillar shrine is. And as you will, will, will show me, the last time we were there, we were looking at this head and you you can actually see it outside of the, of the pillar shrine itself. You can go a distance of 50, 60 feet and you can still see it looking towards the horizon. And, you know, I think that it's looking towards its celestial counterpart. In other words, the active spirit of the Milky Way serpent. And this is obviously all part of a ritualistic process. Now, the other, now, before we go on to the, 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 the next part, any thoughts there, Hugh, yourself? Well, yeah, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think it's uh, fantastic research, to be honest with you. Um, the way it all kind of just locks together, you know, this from the winter solstice, the summer solstice, with the star movements, the Milky Way, it's really quite interesting. And we've got we've got more, but but we're going to research this when we go there in September, because we think even though it's ten degrees off east, we think there could be something very important with the equinox as well. Um, 
also with Venus as well. But again, we're still researching this, so we can't really talk too much about it yet. But um, we found we're finding the Venus connection with the winter solstice and possibly with the equinox as well but more on that later um but yeah i think what what has been found there so far is is absolutely brilliant and um yeah i'm delighted it's all coming out and this really began just by uh you taking a look back in sept- what, september october 2021 at overhead plans when the first photographs came out of uh of the site which i think i sent you the, the kind of link to it and then you did the research and suddenly everything's been unfolding ever since so it's been a kind of revelatory uh, year or two when it comes to this yeah obviously you can join us there in september we do tours every september and every may you can see it all on megalithomania.co.uk also on andrewcollins.com we get to as many of these sites as we can and we're going to be sharing it at the Origins Conference on the 4th of November, 2023. And of course, you can join us in ancient Egypt. We take trips out there every November. We're going to be focusing on uh, Sobek Neferu, the theme of Andrew's brand new book, which is coming out now. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you, Andrew. Um, there's so much more going on. There's a lot more than this we've got to share with you. We just wanted to kind of give you some highlights of what's been uncovered so far. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Andrew. If you've got anything you'd like to add, please do. And we'll say farewell to everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing you can add is that, you know, we're discovering new stuff all the time and it's only going to continue. You know, the more what archaeologists do at the different sites and the more trips that we make, I mean, you know, we're we're just finding stuff in villages, and it's stuff which some of the archaeologists are, are, are not even aware of. Um, so, you know, there's like two things going on here: what the archaeologists are officially doing, uh, and what we're doing, which is you know pure exploration and adventure. Um, and the fruits of that are in the books that we write, the articles, the the, the, the great videos. So, just watch this space, you know we'll reveal what we can as soon as we can. I mean, we're not going to be holding this back, you know, for books that won't come out for two or three years or whatever. We'll tell you as we find stuff. Megalithomaniacs, thanks for watching once again. Please subscribe. Please also subscribe to Andrew's channel. Uh, Check that out. And, um, yeah, we hope to see you out exploring these sites in the near future. Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching.